Do not expect troubles, as they have a tendency not to disappoint. Chapter 14 The Brain A Broadcasting and Receiving Station for Thought The Twelfth Step Toward Riches It was while I was working with the late Dr. Alexander Graham Bell and Dr. Elmer R. Gates that I first proposed the idea that every human brain is both a broadcasting and receiving station for the vibration of thought. In some way similar to the principle behind the operation of a radio receiver, every human brain is capable of picking up vibrations of thought that are being released by other brains. These are received as hunches and flashes of intuition. As was explained in previous chapters, it is your creative imagination that is the receiving set of your brain, which receives thoughts from your subconscious and under certain circumstances receives thoughts released by the brains of others. Your creative imagination is the interconnection between your conscious or reasoning mind and the four sources from which you receive thought stimuli. One, consciously from other people. Two, your subconscious. Three, subconsciously from other people, and four, infinite intelligence. When stimulated or stepped up to a high rate of vibration, the mind becomes more receptive to thoughts that reach it from outside sources. This stepping up process takes place through either the positive emotions or the negative emotions. Through the emotions, the vibrations of thought may be increased. The brain that has been stimulated by emotions functions at a much more rapid rate than it does when that emotion is quieted or absent. The result is the increase of thought to such a pitch that the creative imagination becomes highly receptive to ideas. On the other hand, when the brain is functioning at a rapid rate, it also gives to your own thoughts the emotional feeling that is essential before those thoughts will be picked up and acted upon by your subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is the sending station of the brain, through which vibrations of thought are broadcast. Autosuggestion is the medium by which you may put into operation your sending station. The creative imagination is the receiving set through which the energies of thought are picked up. Editor's Comments The following combines the above concept with the related materials from previous chapters to provide a step-by-step -step recap of Napoleon Hill's view of the process. 1. The brain is simultaneously both a broadcaster and a receiver. 2. Emotion affects both your ability to send and your ability to receive. When under the effect of strong emotion, the more powerfully you can send thoughts. When under the effect of strong emotion, the more receptive you are to receiving thoughts. 3. When you send thoughts, to where do you send them? You send them to your subconscious by using auto-suggestion. 4. When you receive thoughts, where do they come from? They come from your subconscious and you receive them through your creative imagination. 5. Your subconscious mind has two aspects. Your subconscious is a storehouse of information, as explained in the previous chapter. Your subconscious is your connection to infinite intelligence. 6. Infinite intelligence is the medium through which you receive thoughts from other brains. Infinite intelligence is Hill's term for describing the following basic law of physics. Because everything in the universe is made of time, space, energy, or matter, and because matter is just energy in a different form, then everything is actually different parts of the same thing. This means that your subconscious mind, energy, has a common base with every other subconscious mind, energy. 7. Thoughts from other brains come to you as follows. When you are under the effect of a strong emotion and your receiver is especially receptive, Sometimes its pull is so strong that it attracts a thought from the subconscious mind of another brain. It is able to do this because infinite intelligence interconnects your subconscious with the subconscious of the other brain. 8. These thoughts from other brains are what we refer to as intuition, 
hunches, déjà vu, and foreknowledge. Although Hill's explanation depends on the action of an intangible force that cannot be isolated and dissected in a laboratory, neither medical science nor psychology can offer a better explanation for those thoughts that depend on knowledge or information that we do not have. This is the end of the editor's comments. The greatest forces are intangible. In the past, we've depended too much on our physical senses and have limited our knowledge to physical things that we could see, touch, weigh, and measure. I believe we have entered the most marvelous of all ages, an age that will teach us more about the intangible forces of the world about us. Perhaps we shall learn that there is an other self that is more powerful than the physical self we see when we look in a mirror. Many people do not take seriously such intangibles, the things that they cannot perceive through any of their five senses. However, to belittle the idea of forces that are intangible or cannot be explained is to ignore the fact that all of us, every day, are controlled by forces that are unseen and intangible. The whole of mankind has not the power to cope with nor to control the intangible force wrapped up in the rolling waves of the oceans. We still do not fully understand the intangible force of gravity, which keeps this little earth suspended in space and keeps us from falling from it, much less have the power to control that force. We are entirely subservient to the intangible force that comes with a thunderstorm, and we are just as helpless in the presence of the intangible force of electricity. We do not understand the intangible force and intelligence wrapped up in the soil of the earth. The force that provides us with every morsel of food we eat, every article of clothing we wear, and every dollar we carry in our pockets. Last but not least, with all of our culture and education, we still understand little or nothing of the greatest of all the intangibles thought. However, we have begun to learn a good deal about the intricate workings of the physical brain, and the results are stunning. We know that the central switchboard of the human brain, the number of lines that connect the brain cells to each other, is written as the figure 1, followed by 15 million zeros. Dr. C. Judson Herrick of the University of Chicago says, the figure is so stupendous that astronomical figures, dealing with hundreds of millions of light years, become insignificant by comparison. It has been determined that there are from 10 billion to 14 billion nerve cells in the human cerebral cortex, and we know that these are arranged in definite patterns. These arrangements are not haphazard. They are orderly. It is inconceivable to me that such a network of intricate machinery should be in existence for the sole purpose of carrying on the physical functions connected with the growth and maintenance of the physical body. Is it not likely that the same system, which gives billions of brain cells the media for communication, one with another, also provides the means of communication with other intangible forces? Editor's Comments In the time since Hill wrote the above comments, we have learned a great deal more about the physical brain and how it operates. We understand much about the chemistry of the brain. We can measure the energies it releases. We know which areas control the various functions of the body and which areas affect memory, emotions, reasoning, and many other subtleties related to the thinking process. Through surgery, medication, and other techniques, we know how to prevent the brain from having certain kinds of thoughts and we know how to encourage the brain to produce certain other kinds of thoughts when we want it to. For instance, a specific area can be stimulated, and you will have pleasurable thoughts. But we cannot yet control what those pleasurable thoughts will be, and we have no idea what the bits and pieces of information are that go into your pleasurable thoughts. With all of our advanced knowledge about the physical brain, we still don't know how to make it have a specific thought or idea, especially not an original thought or a creative idea. And medical science offers no better theory than Hill's as to how we could have an intuition or hunch made up from information that we don't have 
and were never exposed to. In short, the physical properties of the brain confirm that it is where the thinking process takes place, but it does not offer the answer to the question of how it happens, or how thoughts from one brain might travel to another. In previous commentaries, we pointed to the laws of physics as they relate to Hill's theory about the interconnectedness of all things. And although this is not meant to be a science lesson, it may reassure you to know that the work of renowned scientists lends support to the idea. Quantum theory deals with subatomic particles so minuscule that they are almost at the level of the basic stuff from which everything is made. Albert Einstein developed what is called the EPR effect, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and Irish physicist John Stuart Bell proposed Bell's theorem, both of which pertain to the concept that when two linked subatomic particles are separated from each other, when a change is made to particle A, the same change will instantly happen in particle B, even though the two are distant from each other. Another related concept is called the holographic brain or holographic universe and is named after an unusual quality of holograms. It is a fact that if you cut a hologram in half, you don't get two halves of a picture. You get two separate but complete pictures. Cut either one of those in half, and you get another two complete pictures. Cut other pieces, and again you get whole images. Every part of a hologram has the whole of the information in the original. In the 1970s, Carl Prebram, a neurophysiologist at Stanford University, announced the results of his studies which suggest that memory is not in a specific part of the brain, but is spread throughout the brain like the image on a holographic plate. At almost the same time, renowned physicist David Bohm proposed that the workings of the universe were like a holographic image, that among all things there is total interconnectivity and that all things influence all other things. In effect, every part of the universe contains the whole of the universe. That is probably more than enough science for most readers. The point is, Hill was not alone in his conclusion that through some intangible force, your subconscious shares interconnectivity with everything else in the universe. Previously, the example was given of the folds and bumps in a tablecloth all being different, but all still tablecloth. Here is another way to envision the intangible interconnection of all things. Suppose you were to drill five holes in a wall and have someone outside the room put their fingers and thumb through the holes and wiggle them. If you then bring into your room someone who only believes in tangible things that he or she can see, that person will see five separate objects that can move independently of each other. You may tell the person that behind the wall the objects are connected and all part of the same hand, but because they cannot see the connection and disbelieve anything they don't understand, the person will not be convinced. Neither modern medicine nor psychiatry nor technology can yet conclusively show us behind the wall, but the fact remains we have all had a hunch about somebody and it turns out to be right, a premonition that something will happen and it does or a feeling that something isn't right with someone who is not there with you, and it turns out to be true. How does this information come to us? As mentioned previously, psychologist Carl Jung called the intangible connection the collective unconscious, also called universal subconscious. Others call it the totally unified theory, the great first cause, the universal mind or spirit, and some see it as another way of describing God. Napoleon Hill calls it infinite intelligence and offers a common-sense explanation that allows you to work with a phenomenon, even if it is not completely understood. And that, after all, is what Hill was aiming for, to give you a way to access intangible forces that will help you turn your desire into reality. This is the end of the editor's comments. After this book had been written, just before the manuscript went to the publisher, the New York Times published an editorial showing that at least one great university and one intelligent investigator in the field of mental phenomena 
are carrying on an organized research through which conclusions have been reached that parallel many of those described in this and the following chapter. The editorial briefly analyzed the work carried on by Dr. J. B. Ryan and his associates at Duke University. From the New York Times What is telepathy? A month ago, we cited on this page some of the remarkable results achieved by Professor Ryan and his associates in Duke University from more than a 100,000 tests to determine the existence of telepathy and clairvoyance. These results were summarized in the first two articles in Harper's Magazine. In the second, which has now appeared, the author, E. H. Wright, attempts to summarize what has been learned, or what it seems reasonable to infer, regarding the exact nature of these extrasensory modes of perception. The actual existence of telepathy and clairvoyance now seems to some scientists enormously probable as the result of Ryan's experiments. Various percipients were asked to name as many cards in a special pack as they could without looking at them and without other sensory access to them. About a score of men and women were discovered who could regularly name so many of the cards correctly that there was not one chance in many a million million of their having done their feats by luck or accident. But how did they do them? These powers, assuming that they exist, do not seem to be sensory. There is no known organ for them. The experiments work just as well at distances of several hundred miles as they did in the same room. These facts also dispose, in Mr. Wright's opinion, of the attempt to explain telepathy or clairvoyance through any physical theory of radiation. All known forms of radiant energy decline inversely as the square of the distance traversed. Telepathy and clairvoyance do not. But they do vary through physical cause, as our other mental powers do. Contrary to widespread opinion, they do not improve when the percipient is asleep or half asleep, but on the contrary, when he is most wide awake and alert. Ryan discovered that a narcotic will invariably lower a percipient score, while a stimulant will always send it higher. The most reliable performer apparently cannot make a good score unless he tries to do his best. One conclusion that Wright draws with some confidence is that telepathy and clairvoyance are really one and the same gift. That is, the faculty that sees a card face down on a table seems to be exactly the same one that reads a thought residing only in another mind. There are several grounds for believing this. So far, the two gifts have been found in every person who has either of them. If you have the abilities, both seem to be of equal strength. Screens, walls, distances have no effect at all on either. Wright expresses his hunch that other extrasensory experiences, such as prophetic dreams, premonitions of disaster and the like, may also prove to be part of the same faculty. The reader is not asked to accept any of these conclusions, but the evidence that Ryan has piled up must remain impressive. In 1927, Dr. J. B. Ryan and his wife, Dr. Louisa E. Ryan, joined Professor William McDougall, chairman of the psychology department at Duke University, to create a lab that would apply strict scientific procedures to the study of psychic phenomena. They developed scientific methodologies and procedures to study, identify, and test individuals who demonstrated unusual abilities. It was Dr. Ryan who coined the term extrasensory perception, ESP, and he adopted the word parapsychology to describe their studies. It is fair to say that the research done at the Ryan lab is some of the most advanced work on the entire subject. In 1962, they created the foundation for research into the nature of man in order to continue their studies independent of the university and to publish related works. In 1995, the name was changed to the Rhine Research Institute. This is the end of the editor's comments. How to Join Minds in Teamwork in view of Dr. Ryan's findings about the conditions under which the mind responds to what he terms extrasensory modes of perception, I would like to add my own observations. My associates and I have discovered what we believe to be the ideal conditions under which the mind can be stimulated so that this sixth sense 
can be made to function in a practical way. To begin with, I should explain that there is a close working alliance between myself and two members of my staff. Through experimentation and practice, we have discovered how to stimulate our minds so that we can, by a process of blending our three minds into one, find the solution to a great variety of problems that are submitted by my clients. The procedure is very simple. We sit down at a conference table, clearly state the nature of the problem we have under consideration, then begin discussing it. Each contributes whatever thoughts may occur by applying the principle used in connection with the invisible counselors described in the next chapter. The strange thing about this method of mind stimulation is that it places each participant in communication with unknown sources of knowledge definitely outside their own experience. If you understand the principle described in the chapter on the mastermind, you of course recognize the round table as being a practical application of the mastermind. This method of mind stimulation, through the discussion of definite subjects between three people, illustrates the simplest and most practical use of the mastermind. When you tap into the power of your mastermind group, you will find that the more you work together, the more each member will learn to anticipate the ideas of others and to connect immediately with their intense enthusiasm and inspiration. You cannot completely control this process, but the more you use it, the more it will come into play. By adopting and following a similar plan, you will be making use of the famous Carnegie formula described in Chapter 1. If it means nothing to you at this time, mark this page and read it again after you have finished the last chapter.